My name is Arnav Dixit. I am one of the co-founders and co-presidents of Inspirante Education. I am a 17-year-old junior at Lindbergh High School. I am extremely passionate about computer science, as I hope to expand upon my previous endeavors in the field. I am an active member of the Lindbergh Varsity Policy Debate Team and the Lindbergh First Tech Challenge Robotics Team. I am interested in giving back to my community as much as possible. Today, I had the privilege of being joined by Professor Michael Ball, a full-time lecturer at the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at UC Berkeley. In our discussion, we discuss a wide range of computer science-related topics, from applying to college as a CS major to the different applications of programming skills in society and in the industry. Professor Ball, we're glad to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. This should be fun. Yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, how has your quarantine been? Not too bad. Uh, fortunately, I have, uh, you know, a, a reasonable space. Um, I've spent, I suppose now it's been yeah, just over a year. So a lot of that's been uh, actually setting up my environment to do things like remote teaching, recording videos, and so on. So uh, I've built up kind of a small studio in my apartment. Have you spent more time with your family? No, probably less than normal. Um, I went home over the holidays. Um, but otherwise, and I saw them uh, for a couple of days for my birthday last year. But um, I haven't been home very much, but I'll probably be going back in a few weeks. So uh, now that uh, I have, or I'll get my second shot soon, but um, my parents will get their shots soon as well. And so um, hopefully this summer we're going to... Uh, we're, we're figuring out what we can plan that uh, was not, you know, was upended last summer. So uh, that should be fun. Yeah, sure. It's like that for all of us. Yeah. So you live away from your family then, right? So I grew up in SoCal. Um, oh. And um, I moved up here, I guess, when I went and started at Berkeley. Um, I have some extended family in the Bay Area. So, um, you know, usually my parents will come up here or I would have before, uh, you know, with the family a few times a year. So um, it's been good. I mean, I've been able to see a few people uh, you know, here and there, but, um, much less so than normal. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm pretty used to, uh, doing the drive up and down California. Yeah. It's tough, but eventually we'll get past it. Yeah. I was teaching Ben like during the pandemic, because as you said before, it's been a little different, especially with the computer science. Uh, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I've done some working on online courses before, so, uh, it's not, you know, a lot of the ideas I think are things that I, I feel like can work or can be effective. Um, I mean, the biggest thing last, you know, March was no one was really prepared for this. Um, and so that was a pretty big shift, um, over the fall and spring, I think, you know, for computer science at Berkeley, uh, we've already been used to recording most of our content. We haven't really designed online courses necessarily. Like, you know, you're meant to go in person, but all the webcasts are available. Uh, all the notes are online. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of students that, um, you know, just prefer to watch the webcasts instead of going to lecture anyway. And so for some of them, I think that was an easy adaptation uh, in terms of lectures. Uh, not seeing your TA a few times a week or all your TAs, I guess, over the course of a semester, um, you know, that was really hard and doing group work remotely. Um, all these things can be done. I think, you know, we've mostly learned how to adapt, um, but that was a pretty big shift. And so I know, you know, for a lot of teams, just trying to uh, rejigger team projects um, to be remote. And then in the fall, the real big challenge is, um, somewhere between 15 and 20% of Berkeley students are international students. And so, um, and then you have another uh, 10 to 15%, uh, I suppose, that are uh, uh, out of state uh, US citizens. So, um, you know, a three hour time difference, something that you can probably make work without too much hassle, um, especially if you avoid, you know, too late or too early in the morning. Um, but you know, this past fall and spring, I've been working with student teams who have uh, one or two members in China, someone in Singapore, a couple of people in the Bay Area, and then someone on the East Coast. Uh, like literally five of the six team members are in different time zones. Um, and that's been a real big challenge because there's just been no, you know, great solution um, for things like that. And I've spent some time working in industry with, you know, companies who are distributed internationally. And I collaborate with people uh, in Germany and Spain. And when you 
work with the style where you can meet infrequently. You really do learn how to you know, make it work. Um, but for, you know, for, for projects and just meeting peers, that's been, um, I think one of the hardest things that, I mean, by and large, you still make it work. You, you get to meet new people and work together, but, uh, that, that's been a real big challenge. Um, and then aside from all of that, um, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, just the exhaustion of a quarantine itself is, uh, something that we really don't know how to deal with, um, as a society. And at the beginning, I think we're sort of all in this together kind of moment. Um, wow, that sounded very high school musical to me. Um, but like, you know, we have, um, we had a collective feeling at, at the beginning of last year of like, okay, we'll get through this. And what I really saw is in the fall is a lot of people just feeling really tired. Um, and Christmas winter break kind of helps with that. But it, the biggest thing I see now is everyone is kind of just more worn down than normal. Um, and this week right now as we're recording is our spring break at Berkeley. And so I think, you know, I mean, everyone's always looking forward to spring break. Um, you know, it's a nice time of the year, especially after the exciting time, but I think more than normal, uh, everyone was feeling the need, uh, for a break. And so, you know, I think hopefully, uh, if, you know, everyone can sort of play their cards right, um, and, you know, kind of hold it together for a few more months, well, you know, like everyone is just really, that I know is looking forward to the summer. Um, and that's kind of the optimism right now, keeping people going. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Quarantine can very like very like really be a lot of um you can encounter a lot of difficulties and it could be hard to focus. Even at yeah. me as a high schooler, I noticed that like I can't as well like focus on my studies and um it's it's a lot harder to. And one of the things for me, and like one of the reasons that like, you know, I enjoy um particularly university environment, but I'd say like why I enjoyed high school more than I just enjoyed well, to the extent that I remember, like, you know, enjoying elementary school, but like, <laughs> you have this movement throughout your day. Um, and one of the things that I found tiring about being a software engineer, um, is just sitting at your computer all day long. Like, I love writing code. Um, it is really fun. I, I mean, this week, I've been working on some projects that I couldn't get to. And it's nice to just kind of get distracted for a few hours, right, on any kind of project that you enjoy. But day in and day out, just sitting at your computer, without someone forcing you to get up and walk around like you know the, it'll be like four hours in a day before like the furthest walking i go is to the fridge which is not very far um and i think for me that's been the biggest thing that in terms of like daily movement that i miss and then just you know the interaction of uh chatting with people sort of uh before and after class uh just meeting someone new in the hallway or you know office hours um all those things are possible, but so much more strained. And that was where I think a lot of energy, uh, you know, everyone kind of pulled on each other's energy. Even if you're an introvert, I think you found that there are times where you got that energy uh, from from talking to other people or just, uh, you know, working, solving a problem together, whatever it might be. Yeah, for sure. Um, also, like you said, that uh, there are a lot of students who prefer like videos or not actually going to in-person class. Uh, would you say that for those students, it's also um, substantially more difficult for them to learn or is it um, maybe normal for them? I mean, I, I think, so this is what, this is one of those hard questions. Um, you know, I, I think by and large having the videos uh, is, you know, from a content perspective, it's fairly similar. Uh, like at Berkeley, we've definitely, you know, uh, especially when things got uh, really tense in the spring and then at various times in the fall, um, you know, we would adjust schedules. And so I think every class has skipped, you know, one of the extra topics that they might normally want to get to or, or reshuffle things. Um, but by and large, you know, the delivery of content, um, if you're lecturing, is not too terribly different if it's sort of just a one-way thing. Um of course, like most good classes are not just one way, you know, delivery mechanisms, right? Um, and so what I've seen is a lot of students are really able to learn the stuff that they want to learn or that they need to learn. Um, but it, they either feel like it's taking them longer or they're expending a lot more energy to do it, um, especially in those places where 
the classes that I teach have a lot of group work. And uh, during lecture, we would normally spend more time, you know, just having students talk to each other for a minute or two. Um, and we do some of that and it still kind of works. But, I, you know, I think that the, the sort of just cost to get to the baseline for certain kinds of activities is a lot higher. And so um, what I really see like is it feels like a lot of people are, um, they're making it work, but it's, you know, taking a lot more out of them. And so uh, you kind of just feel more drained at the end of the day. Yeah. Also, like you said before, a lot of these students are like distanced. So it might be like hard to like get everyone on the same page. On the other hand, there's been a lot of really cool things. So like, um, you know, I've always thought of myself as relatively flexible on deadlines and accommodations um, and, you know, providing multiple ways of learning things and making videos available after the fact. Um, but I think that for a number of students, you know, things like just default enabling transcripts in Zoom, even though they're automatic and not perfect, um, or giving, you know, just saying like, look, we know there's a pandemic. If you need an extension, we'll make it work. Um, and realizing that like the world doesn't fall to pieces when you trust students to, uh, you know, sort of manage their own schedules a little bit more. And so I think there are a lot of positive changes um, that we've been able to make by just giving people more opportunities to learn or to turn in work. And my hope is that, you know, returning to normal uh, at least keeps some of these positive enhancements, which work, you know, they seem to work well for all kinds of students, right? Like uh, if something happens, regardless of whether it's coronavirus related or not, uh, having an instructor who can be like, yeah, look, the syllabus this semester gives you extra time or something like that um, are really helpful uh, sort of uh, accommodations that we've made. Yeah, I feel like it allows students to really just slow down a bit and learn the material and just yeah. stay comfortable with it as well. My other question was regarding, you know, the content taught with regards mm -hmm. to computer science. Uh, you were earlier saying that it's substantially more difficult for students to sort of get on the same page now that everything mm -hmm. is online. But uh, since a lot of computer science uh, technologies are online itself, mm -hmm. um, are some things easier than others? So I think there's a couple pieces where, um, you know, uh, we've found uh, cer certain types of work to be a little bit more easy. Um, and it, in, in particular, when you're collaborating and you want to share a screen. Um, so one of the cool things is in lecture for one of my courses, that's um, at Berkeley, if you're interested in looking up, uh, it comes in various versions, but CS169 uh, is, is the primary course. Um, and this semester we're teaching sort of a, a more focused lab version, which is just the project component. Um, we can do things more easily, like pull up student code in lecture and they can share the screen or, um, you know, just making it a little bit more easy to, uh, you know, like before you could, of course you plug your computer into the projector and whatnot, but, um, you know, there is some fluidity in having anyone be able to share their screen or in office hours when I work with students, um, you know, instead of just walking over to their computer, um, which I miss being able to do. It's also really nice to um, make it a little bit easier for, for someone to share their work with more than just one person in that moment without it being, you know, such a big deal. Um, and even though I think we've all had to, you know, everyone's kind of learned what they need to learn about Zoom, um, in many ways, it's still a lot easier than fiddling with video adapters and projectors. Um, so, you know, there's, there's sort of mi minor uh, enhancements there. And then the other thing is for code. Um, I think the, the hard part that I've seen is that um, there, you know, there are certain types of uh, sort of mechanisms where if you want to draw together, um, we've all found various whiteboard tools that kind of work, um, but they're not the same as being in person. And when you're collaborating with someone, um, you have all these tools and it's just a matter of finding the ones that work well for you. Um, and I don't think there's like a universal set. And so I've definitely seen uh, teams who find it really easy to work together because they found either the whiteboard app or the ways that they want to use GitHub together, for example, if they're working on you know just pure code um, or how they wanna use Zoom as a team or something like that. And so um, those kinds of things can definitely um, be a huge advantage. Uh, I know a lot of students have found uh, pretty cool communities around various Discord servers that have popped up. Um, 
and so that's definitely something that like we're looking at sort of taking forward too is you know um the asynchronous text uh we used to use this tool called piazza or now ed that are class discussion and q a forums and those have worked really well too um and they've been a huge help um but you know how do we like you know it's way harder to build community uh remotely but the places that we have been doing it um how do we keep some of those bits too and i i think um you know discord slack those kind of tools have also been really helpful uh for just kind of kind of getting to know uh, your peers so more students are really finding ways online to just get to know each other are n not just students at berkeley per se but like students around the world who have the same like interests um especially with regard to cs correct yeah yeah that's definitely really cool um i feel like before this sort of happened like on linkedin i feel like students would apply to job positions even connecting with each other would help but uh i feel like what's really happening um like with regards to just like curricular education and students just connecting with each other that way um i think that helps a lot and i i mean i think for a lot of students too um it's i mean you know it's sort of just both uh there's, there's fortunate and unfortunate pieces to it right um your community is instead of having hundreds of students go to career fair together, um, you're like, well, we can't do that. So how do we find a community online? Um, and the really cool thing is for, you know, it when it's sort of online, that, that community can be broader. It can span time zones. It can be uh, either students not at Berkeley, or it could even be Berkeley students who you w might interact with, you know, less frequently. Um, and so, I think that you know, all those things have been uh, really, um, you know, potentially helpful uh, tools that we've kind of learned in the pandemic. And then, as you mentioned, just sort of searching online, I think that there's a, um, and everyone has talked for the past few years, right, about like the challenges of social media in various ways. Um, and I mean, I, I have no idea how to quantify this because at the same time, there are hugely problematic things relating to misinformation that keep increasing. But anecdotally, I've also seen more and more students trying to use their social media platforms in a really positive way to connect with others, um, whether that is um, just searching for people that have some interests that they wouldn't have before, or, you know, just making sure that instead of, um, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen in my classes too often, but, you know, if you don't like your teacher's videos, you feel a little bit more compelled to search for someone else on YouTube. And there is, you know, a ton of really cool stuff on YouTube, um, you know, and elsewhere. And so I think that um, we are kind of learning how to, uh, um, you know, some of, you know, some of us would work, maybe the people that would naturally branch out into these things and others were not. And so I think we're also kind of learning how to, uh, uh, you know, find that information sort of outside of our, our usual circles. Well, yeah, that's really cool. Um, this whole revolution that's really happening with uh, students connecting with each other. Uh, and maybe in the future, this will continue after the pandemic. Um, you mentioned that you teach CS169. Uh, what exactly is, does that course entail? Is, I think, one of um, uh, the more uh, really like kind of unique courses that Berkeley offers. And it's now taught um, in various uh you know, uh, institutions. Um, but uh, the course was originally developed. Um, well, it's gone through quite a few iterations, but, um, by, by my advisor, Armando Fox, um, or co-advisor, um, and in his version of the course is what are all the skills that students need, um, to be really productive software engineers, uh, that are not just the mechanics of writing code. Like, Obviously, if you're going to spend your day job writing code, <laughs> the mechanics of writing code are important, right? Um, but a lot of it is, you know, how can we apply, uh, you know, uh, actual methodology to the pieces that we don't normally think of? So working as a team, uh, doing things like code review, uh, you know, trying to build a product as a whole. Um, and so the, the goal of the course is um, it's, you know, the official title is like software engineering team project. Um, and basically what you do is depending on the, ver the f exact flavor and the way it's taught, um, you're in a group 
of either four or six students. And uh, the first part of the course is all the mechanics of building modern web applications. So uh, sort of high level design patterns for structuring an application. Uh, how does you know the front end browser talk to the server? How do you talk to a database and store data and those kinds of questions? Um, you know, the, the, there are some sort of just uh, code design level things um, that, that you need to know. But then the second half of the course is going through in a multi-week project with a team and building out some of the features. So uh, in the past year, um, we've been working on an assignment that is, um, uh, the name is called Action Map, but it's basically just a, um, you could sort of think of it as like any one of the tools that would help you do some sort of political organizing or uh, generating interest around issues. So finding, uh, you know, a database of candidates, what their positions are, helping you do research. And I mean, the, the point of the project is not necessarily to be something in this form that, you know, would actually be a real tool that organizers would use, but a very practical example of how uh, you as a student uh, who's, you know, learning how to, how to build this software could uh, work with others to build something that is uh, being deployed and used in the real world. Um, and then throughout this process, like one of our sort of, you know, additional goals is to just show students that like uh, the way in which you build software also has an effect on communities and the people who use it. And so uh, can we talk about building software in sustainable ways that are hopefully not just burning you out as an individual working on a team, you know, for, for a big tech company, but also are you working on problems? Uh, are you thinking about problems that are helpful, you know, to the world? Um, are you designing software with uh, web accessibility in mind? Are, are you doing following best practices that make sure that you meet the needs of users who might be blind or who might uh, not be able to use a mouse and have to rely on a keyboard the same way um, or have just other assistive input devices? And so those are some of the things that we also try and bring into the course. Um, and the course in particular is taught on this platform called Ruby on Rails, um, which, you know, I like we think is a really good choice. Um, but the really cool thing is uh, the textbook itself um, by by Professor Fox is all open and free online. It uses Ruby on Rails as an example, but all the components and ideas uh, can be applied to any programming language. So you're really learning a process and not, uh, you know, not a specific uh, language or environment, even though throughout the course you will learn those tools. So it's really about how you apply the software engineering and programming language that languages that you know right yeah absolutely um and this semester the, the version that we're teaching is this lab-based course and so we ended up with uh about 50 students who took uh the sort of uh standard um version which is now called cs 169a for various reasons uh in the fall and there's 50 students who are taking just the lab component this semester and what they're doing is uh they're working in teams of six um, for the entire semester, um, and uh, all of their projects are uh, unique. So each team has a different project. They're working with uh, their uh, our teaching assistants. We call them coaches in this course uh, because that's the metaphor that you should think of them as. They're helping you uh, each week build that discipline, uh, give you feedback on the, you know, instead of uh, your sort of practice regimen and your you know your form. Um, it is your coding, uh, your team mechanics, and so on. Uh, but their projects are all with an external client. So uh, I am sort of the client uh, for a couple of projects where students, uh, one group is working on um, a tool for managing um, uh, a series of uh, professional development workshops and applications uh, that I work on with others. Another group is working on a tool that is uh, a web app for managing a summer conference that we run. Um, those are two of the projects that I'm working with, but we have others that are working on uh, a, uh, a management application for local theater groups, um, a local birding nonprofit uh, wanted an application uh, to track some stuff. Um, I don't even know the full details of, of exactly what that uh, team is working on, but we try and find sort of local groups, uh, nonprofit organizations that need some 
you know, some software built that fits this mold of a web application um, that has a database that sort of illustrates the, uh, you know, some of the techniques that we want students to be able to learn. Um, and so the students work with them to define requirements, build features, uh, deploy software. And so the really cool thing is for a lot of these projects, um, it's almost like an internship as a class in that, uh, they, you know, in the first month, they go from ramping up an entirely new piece of code um, to working with their client, their coaches, and that code will hopefully be deployed to production um, and get used by uh, by people outside of the class with, you know, in a month or two. And that will happen, uh, you know, a few times throughout the semester too. So the class sort of functions like a company, right? Where you have a development team, a testing team, and a production team as well, correct? Yeah, a little bit. Um, in the case of sort of different teams, each student group um, would sort of serve as all three functions of what might happen on, you know, in a much larger company uh, because we want them to get that experience. Um, but it does, uh, in many ways, um, it's sort of like a, um, a, you know, like a series of companies. You can almost think of it you know, some people have described it a little bit like a consulting agency where uh, you are, um, you know, you're part of a bunch of teams and those teams at your consulting agency are working on uh, what are pretty different projects, but maybe around uh, the same kind of domain or tools required. And so, um, yeah, those are definitely kind of ways um, that people have described it. Um, you know, a lot of students go on from completing the course um, to, uh, you know, take internships so they really get to apply things. Or we have students who have done an internship um, and, you know, they wrote a lot of code at their internship, um, even if it was at a big tech company, but didn't necessarily get some of the training other than just the, like, you know, how do you learn how to write code? Um, and so, you know, one of the things is the course really gets to fill in all the missing pieces, uh, even for students who have had uh, some of that prior experience. Yeah, it's really cool because you get to apply a lot of the coding experience that you have to many different things. And I think that's really the beauty of computer science that it has so many different applications and so many different fields you can really specify into get involved in um, applying your knowledge really. So the class sort of functions like a company, right? Where you have a development team, a testing team, and a production team as well, correct? A little bit. Um... In the case of sort of different teams, each student group um, would sort of serve as all three functions of what might happen on, you know, in a much larger company uh, because we want them to get that experience. Um, but it does, uh, in many ways, um, it's sort of like a, um, a, you know, like a series of companies. You can almost think of it you know, some people have described it a little bit like a consulting agency where uh, you are, um, you know, you're part of a bunch of teams and those teams at your consulting agency are working on uh, what are pretty different projects, but maybe around uh, the same kind of domain or tools required. And so, um, yeah, those are definitely kind of ways um, that people have described it. Um, you know, a lot of students go on from completing the course um, to, uh, you know, take internships so they really get to apply things. Or we have students who have done an internship um, and, you know, they wrote a lot of code at their internship, um, even if it was at a big tech company, but didn't necessarily get some of the training other than just the, like, you know, how do you learn how to write code? Um, and so, you know, one of the things is the course really gets to fill in all the missing pieces, uh, even for students who have had uh, some of that prior experience. Yeah, it's really cool because you get to apply a lot of the coding experience that you have to many different things. And I think that's really the beauty of computer science, that it has so many different applications and so many different fields you can really specify and to get involved in um, applying your knowledge really. Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, sort of broader than the than uh, CS169, but, um, you know, the thing that I talk about students, like the most powerful thing about software is that you can make a computer do whatever you want, which is both good and bad. <laughs> um, but you know, if you're teaching a physics course um, and you don't have software, you're relying on the real world 
uh, to model things out. And if you're teaching a chemistry course um, and you want to demonstrate something, you either need to find uh, you know those chemicals or an alternate version of them. Um, you know, a biology course, you need uh, actual physical animals to do dissections. Uh, and software lets us sort of emulate all of these things, or it lets us practice music without actually having an instrument or, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, keyboard synthesizers are uh, a great tool for, even though it's not the same as uh, playing either the guitar or drums or a saxophone or whatever, but you could play those notes on a keyboard perhaps and then hear them as, you know, an entirely new instrument. Um, and no matter what the discipline is, uh, one of the things that we sort of just hope to think about is, or get students to think about is the ways in which you can apply software to solve real problems. Um, and, and that, you know, the, the limitation is really just what is your creativity in, in making the code do what you want it to do. Um, and to, you know, a smaller extent for certain kinds of problems, there are sort of practical hardware limitations or computing processing limitations. Um, but for the most part, you can get really far without anything super special. Uh, and what we really want students to come away with in, in this case is um, so much of the, you know, the jobs that we see students take on after graduation are, um, are modern uh, software as a service companies. So uh, not just the social media companies, um, but, you know, whether that's tools for uh, teachers, doctors, uh, could be social media um, you know, that, that they really think about trying to build software in a way that is, uh, you know, really beneficial to the users. Um, it's not just, I mean, you know, there, there's value of course in, in advertising driven businesses, but maybe that, uh, people take a second look and figure out what other opportunities they might have, uh, to work on some cool projects. Yeah, for sure. I think that's really the beauty of computer science that there's so much you can do and like a lot of ways you can or actually a lot of different types of projects you can make. Um, this leads us to our next question really as to why do you think you decided to study computer science and maybe become a professor in teaching a computer science subject? Yeah, um, so I think for me, it was, I always thought computers were kind of interesting, even when I was young, but I don't think I knew for certain that I wanted to really study computer science. Um, and I think it's because I, you know, I enjoy coding. I enjoy the hard problems, but theory without application um, is not something that really drives me. Um, for a lot of people, um, you know, theory at all, like there's a certain group of people where theory at all will kind of turn them away. Um, and there's a certain group of people where, uh, you know, theory just for the sake of theory is uh, their goal. And both those things I think are totally valid, right? Um, we need people to focus just on the theory without the application because that's how you get cool research and you need people to uh, understand, uh, you know, and, and apply that and build applications and who don't always, you know, need to know all the theory. Um, most software engineering jobs, you don't need all of the things that you will learn, uh, you know, in a university degree. But uh, for me, what kind of drew me to the field was the very first course I took at Berkeley uh, was this course called CS10 um, that was taught by, or still is taught uh, by my primary advisor, Dan Garcia. Um, and it's a course that's typically designed for non-majors. Um, the reason I took it was because uh, CS6 Dune, uh, which is a really fun course. At the time, the syllabus said you should understand recursion uh, before taking this course, uh, which I've since suggested because it wasn't strictly true. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't, but I was like, well, I don't know what recursion is. So I'll take this other course that teaches me recursion, uh, and then I'll be more prepared, um, which was totally true. Um, but CS10 as a course, um, it does a few things, which is it uses this really cool block space programming language, uh, called snap. Um, and so, uh, for at least for the first two thirds and the last third is in Python. Um, but it also takes a bunch of time that instead of just talking about programming, you talk a lot about the applications of computer science. So there's a guest lecture on things like human computer interaction, um, which is the subfield of how you design and build not just user interfaces, um, but sort of computing devices as a whole, uh, graphics, uh, artificial intelligence, 
uh, computing sort of for social good. So things like global warming, uh, solving sort of, you know, uh, energy level scale problems. Um, and CS10 really drew me in by, by just showing sort of all the different ways which you can use computing to solve different kinds of problems that would encounter in the daily life. And so when I continued on with some of the other computer science courses, I think that gave me a, a much better foundation where as I was learning an algorithm or how some kind of data structure worked or, you know, a little bit more about the theory, I always had this thing of like, okay, well, that's the thing over there that's really keeping me going. Um, and the really fun thing for CS10 as a course is that um, it's a super tight knit close community. So some of my uh, core friend group still came out of people who are teaching assistants uh, for that course at the same time that I still hang out and talk to. Um, but also like that just drew me in uh, into this notion of like, what we're doing here is we're teaching people who've never thought about computer science uh, that this might be an option for them. So CS10 was, if not the first, one of the first computer science courses at Berkeley to have a 50-50 gender parity uh, between men and women, which is super awesome. Um, not, you know, and that uh, that's not just gonna happen by chance, right? That was deliberately going out and recruiting people, um, building a course that is more broadly appealing. So we have, um, you know, not just, uh, it's not just men who want to become computer science, uh, you know, computer scientists taking the course that we drew in, but it's, um, you know, the guys who are senior English majors too, um, a group that you don't typically think of, you know, as, um, you know, maybe that's not a common stereotype in a lot of people's minds, but, um, you know, both uh, from uh, men and women from all parts of campus that would not necessarily think of computer science as something for them that we could at least give them a taste. Um, and that was really fun. And so that's really what kept me in the area of teaching computer science, building tools. So I still work on uh, SNAP, the programming language uh, today. Um, I help build curriculum uh, that gets used in high schools um, that's based on CS10, uh, some of the tooling that gets used for that. And so, um, you know, that was, I think the main thing that, um, while I sort of had interest before, really pulled me in and has kept me going in various ways. Why do you think a lot of students maybe in CS10 don't pursue computer science? Because as you said, um, it's a like class for people who might not want to major mm -hmm. in that course. Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple things. Um, the, the first thing I would say is that at the end of CS10, about uh, somewhere between two thirds um, and four fifths of students, give or take the semester, say that they want to continue learning computer science. Um, and so, you know, those are self surveys. So people always end up being like really interested. Um, you know, and half the students do take some other computer science course at Berkeley. Our goal is not necessarily to have everyone major in computer science. Um, I very much believe that everyone learning some bit of computer science is a really useful skill. Um, but, you know, just in the same way that we need biologists and chemists and mathematicians and musicians and artists, you know, and novelists, uh, not everyone needs to be a computer science major. Um, and so, you know, I think the goal of CS10 is in many ways uh, to make sure that someone who's never thought about computer science, especially if it wasn't offered at their high school, uh, sees it as something that they have the ability to succeed in. Um, and that, you know, they are, uh, we, if, if someone is going to make a choice not to compute, to study computer science, we want it to be because they are interested in some other field more than they're interested in computer science, not because they don't see themselves as a computer scientist. Um, you know, and for some people, I would say, um, in the same way that, you know, music is not my thing, um, perhaps if I practiced more when I was younger, found the right course, it could be my thing. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, computer science is not going to be everyone's thing. And I think, you know, recognizing that is fine. Um, it's mostly that we want to make sure that, you know, learning it is at least a safe space. Um. And then the other thing I'd say for CS10 is we get a number of students who are in their junior and senior year taking the course too. And so 
um, you know, they're just not going to switch their major. But what they might do is either a minor or uh, they might just use those skills to keep learning after graduation. And so I know a number of students who said, like, you know, my, you know, my degree is an English degree, but I'm going to keep thinking about these things or I'm going to use some of this knowledge to help me. Uh, maybe it's write some script that they can use while working on uh, an essay or a novel or something, or just, you know, uh, using their jumping off point of programming to build a website so that they can market themselves. And of course, you know, a website, you can always, um, you know, find plenty of great tools online to do that for you. But I know a lot of students who, you know, they take the pride in, in having the tools to build something themselves that, you know, that is really their own identity. Um, and that's, um, I think, really cool. And then you just have the students who enjoy learning how to program, uh, build uh, games and other fun projects that they share with their friends. And that's also a super cool outcome um, because there's plenty of fun things to do that, you know, that don't have to be this uh, sort of masterpiece of code too. Yeah, sure. I feel like CS10 is a very influential class and really like influences uh, students with regards to whether they want to continue the major or not. And it's a really useful and effective on uh, how it brought you into the field. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's, you know, everyone needs um, sort of their own path, right? And it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but um, it's a path that definitely serves a lot of people really well on it. And I think the really cool thing now is that um, with a, this, uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, some folks at North Carolina State University um, and this group in Boston called uh, EDC, um, we've been developing for the past, ooh, uh, like almost eight or 10 years now uh, in various forms, a really nice high school curriculum. Um, and so we work every summer with, uh, you know, training uh, dozens and dozens of high school teachers who bring it to, uh, you know, high schools all around the country. And so you know, ultimately the goal is like, um, you know, maybe there's a point in time in the future where everyone at Berkeley has come to Berkeley having some, uh, you know, kind of programming experience in high school where they've hopefully had a good, you know, environment to learn. Um, but, you know, really just making sure that students can, uh, no matter where they come uh, from, have, have the opportunity to, to at least explore computer science. Yeah, for sure. Um, my next question is with regards to applying to um, become a CS major yeah. as a high schooler. Um, it's CS is becoming an increasingly difficult field um, a, as a major to apply to mm -hmm. given the competition, um, especially at UC Berkeley. Um, so what would you maybe suggest to a student who wants to major in CS, but is, you know, really daunted by the competition? Yeah. Um, so I think there's two things. Um, and I have to think about this really quick. Um, so I think the one thing I would say is, um, it, so right now it also depends on what year you're graduating high school um, and, and where you're thinking about uh, going. Um, I don't think anything is public yet, but what I will say is that the CS department, the campus as a whole, um, the College of Engineering, um, are looking at various ways that we can improve this experience for students coming to Berkeley. So if you are, um, you know, you're going to be class of 2025 right now, uh, nothing's going to change. Um, 26 and onward, uh, somewhere in that time frame, uh, you know, we're, we're taking like a, you know, really long, hard look at, at how we can improve this process for everyone. Um, so there may be things with specific requirements that, that, that change and adapt in the future. Um, you know, so, uh, if, if you're thinking about applying to Berkeley, what I would say, um, is, you know, don't let this get in the way. Uh, today is the 24th, um, I believe, which means that, uh, for those of you who are graduating high school seniors, uh, you should be getting your admissions letters tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully there's good news in there. Um, and the way that it works at Berkeley is uh, if you're in the College of Engineering, uh, you, at, 
as of today, and again, this you know could change in the future, um, or at least parts of this could. Um, but if you're in the College of Engineering, you don't have to worry about the declaring process. Um, the downside, of course, is that the College of Engineering uh, application is a little bit more selective. For letters and sciences uh, students, there is still this GPA threshold. And so um, what that means is you need a B plus average in three core undergraduate courses. Uh, so CS 61A, CS 61B, and CS 70. Um, and a 3.3 is definitely challenging. Um, you know, it is a lot of work over your first two years. But what I would say is that if you know it's something you want, um, it's three courses over four semesters that you really need to declare. Um, and that potentially includes two summer semesters as well. So, you know, one of the things that I see from a lot of students is you come to Berkeley and there's so much going on. And I still this, feel this way, like as a faculty member, um, I wanna sit in on all my colleagues' courses because they sound fun and interesting. Um, and I mean, they are fun and interesting, it's not just that they sound that way. Um, but what I would say is, you know, don't get too swept up in trying to overload, especially your course schedule. Um, you know, every student needs to take uh, right now 12 or 13 units uh, a semester to be enrolled. And what that means is that you can take one computer science course uh, each semester for the first two years. You can then fill in, you know, some of your requirements, um, which are not going to be easy necessarily, but uh, there's breadth requirements, there's language requirements potentially, uh, reading and composition requirements, um, and then you have all your you know general elective units um, that you might need, or if you want, you know, thinking about a minor or something. And, and what I would say is that uh, students can really fill out a schedule such that. If you're concerned about having the time to dedicate to your CS courses or any of your courses, uh, you you just be a little bit more careful about how you plan out that schedule, um, and and you really try and balance out the workload over, um, you know, a multi-year period instead of all at once. And that could mean taking a course like CS10 uh, before taking a course like 61A to give yourself more time to just, uh, you know, get familiar with programming. Um, basically, CS10 conceptually covers all the material that cs 61 a does, but not in Python and at a higher level. So, um, you know, because it's designed for non-majors, uh, it's sort of, you know, what, like, what are the things to sort of whet your appetite? Uh, what are the things to get you started to read more? Um, you know, that's what I'd say there. I would also say that if you have the time, Almost all of our courses have public versions of their websites, assignments, lecture notes, recordings, um, and you really can start preparing for courses early on uh, if you're concerned um, about time. And so those are, you know, at a sort of how do I get through my first couple of years, um, balance and time, and then preparation are, you know, things where there's no, uh, there's, you know, uh, no substitute for that. But what I would also say is, if you like computing as a whole, where you want to program um, and you're thinking about Berkeley, is that the computer science minor is still pretty open. Um, it can be challenging because you don't have enrollment priority to get into some classes, but most people I know, uh, students, uh, former students, have been able to get the classes that they want, um, especially if they're not you know, too picky uh, with, with uh, courses. Um, talking about, uh, you know, the paths that you can take, uh, the, the thing that I also say for Berkeley in general, and this is true today with the GPA uh, requirements for computer science, um, this will be true in the future uh, if the admissions processes ever change, but it's that you don't need to have a, a computer science degree uh, or even a computer science minor or even a data science uh, major or minor. Uh, to explore and take uh, a lot of computing courses. Um, with just the lower div courses at Berkeley, you can absolutely get uh, internships at uh, companies. Um, and when you have an internship, you know, that it hopefully enables you to get a return offer for an internship or a job uh, if you really want to be a software engineer. Um, and so, 
you know, those are uh, definitely avenues to consider. I, one of my really close friends, um, he's currently at Microsoft um, and he was a statistics major. Um, and so his current role is focusing uh, much more on the statistics side of his work, um, but he is classified as a software engineer at Microsoft uh, working on uh, various kinds of data modeling. And, and that's you know the area that he wanted to focus on, right? Um, which is why he did statistics and, and not necessarily strictly computer science, but he didn't even, you know, um, I don't know why, uh, he very well could have minored in computer science. Um, he took plenty of courses, but maybe not like one or two enough. Um, but you know, he's just like, I don't, I don't need the minor, um, and still has an excellent job at Microsoft, um, doing what he wants to do. Um, you know, got plenty of different interview offers because he was still a strong student, um, and so I think the thing is, if you can demonstrate, um, and this could be through your coursework, it could be through outside projects, it could be through internships, um, it could be through, you know, volunteering, teaching people to code, um, but whatever, you know, kind of avenue that you pick, if you demonstrate that you're interested and capable as, you know, as a programmer and software engineer, um, you know, there are plenty of ways to find excellent opportunities regardless if you major in computer science. And so the one thing that I think I kind of try and get across to students is that like, yes, a computer science major at Berkeley is a hugely valuable thing. Um, it is a great program. It's a pretty intense program, um, you know, it, but, uh, you know, if your goal is to learn to code, to work on really challenging problems, um, then what I would say is Berkeley is a really fun like college experience to explore college and learning about all the things that you get to learn at a university. Um, and you have those opportunities, even if uh, computer science is uh, something you're passionate about. That said, um, you know, for students, especially if anyone is considering, you know, for the upcoming year, like, do you want to deal with the GPA, um, requirements like it's perfectly acceptable to not choose berkeley and choose another school where you don't have to stress out about that um it definitely is a stressful program especially for those first couple of years um but i would also you know say it's just it really is your priority if you know that computer science on your diploma uh is the yeah you know, if that's what you want um then go for that um, and if that means going somewhere other than Berkeley, because you will feel more secure or more comfortable or less stressed, um, and that is a totally valid choice too. It really just depends on uh, what your goals are. If your goals are to just learn computer science, um, you know, if your goal is to perhaps stay in the Bay Area of California um, and learn computer science versus, uh, you know, pick any other top CS program, um, you know, somewhere across the country and learn computer science, like, you would have to decide, you know, would I rather be guaranteed a computer science degree at some other university, but not be in an environment, uh, you know, I mean, it could be an environment that you could thrive on, um, but, you know, pick your priorities then. And I, and I don't think there is a universal ordering of, of those priorities. Um, you know, for me, like Berkeley was a great place to be. Um, I love the Bay Area. Um, I love being close uh, to San Francisco and Oakland as places to go and visit. Um, you know, um, it's a politically fun environment. There's lots of activities outdoors to do and so on. Um, I could have been happy other places, but like, I, you know, I think for me that environment was the bigger thing um, that, that I wanted. Um, and if you figure out what your priorities are, then, you know, and that's something you'll have to do no matter where you're, you're you know, deciding to apply to college or uh, what your degree is. But um, if you figure those out, then I think things will fall into place. And and then to just recognize that, like, diplomas are important. They are a super useful thing. Um, you know, I don't think I would be here, uh, you know, like having Berkeley on my resume helped with getting my first jobs. It helped with, you know, other faculty members well, essentially they trust themselves and they hire former students. <laughs> um, but right, like that is, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a valuable uh, brand in itself. 
um, but it's not the only option too. Um, and so uh, I would just keep that in mind uh, as well. That no matter how you know how it seems today, that there are there are many paths to uh, computing or otherwise careers, and there's many ways to learn programming that aren't strictly just uh, computer science on your diploma. Yeah, especially preparing in high school itself for um, majoring in college in computer science is really valuable. But I noticed that a lot of students don't necessarily know how to like prepare adequately in high school for mm -hmm. computer science in the industry or just mm -hmm. in college. So what would you maybe recommend for students who um, are struggling with that? So I think there's two things. Um, I think preparing is always... Um, you know, it's a tough thing, right? Because um, you need to find you need to find uh, content and exercises and activities that are sort of at the appropriate level. Um, if you have a computer science course at your school, um, no matter sort of how hard or how easy it is, um, it's definitely something to check out. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be an AP computer science course. Um, I think starting out any computer science is better than no computer science if you're interested in, in preparing. Um, but the thing that I'd say in general um, is to find an activity that um, you reasonably think you could build um, and then start working on it. And so that would be, that could be a game. Um, you know, that could be like, I just want to build a version of Sudoku um, and then, you know, that could be, I want to build a personal website. Um, and all of these tasks will have varying levels of sort of how much computer science theory is in them. So a game, you might actually, you know, one of the ways to make a game interesting from a computer science perspective would be to add in some element of the computer making a move and playing that game. So you could, uh, instead of just building a game that lets you play Sudoku, you could build a version of Sudoku where the computer tries to solve the game. Um, or you could build a version of Sudoku that generates puzzles. Um, you know, those, those are types of tasks that will give you a little bit more of the computer science theory. If you're building your website, you know, how can I do something um, that exercises a little bit of the programming aspect? So building something really interactive with JavaScript instead of just a bunch of text could be an example. What I really say is to just start, like, if you want, you know, there, there are ways and activities like that to, to take it further. But the most important thing really is to just say, like, let me build something. Um, you know, do you want to build a mobile phone app versus a website? Either of those will be great starting experience. Um, they'll take you down plenty of rabbit holes that are challenging. Um, they'll take you down paths of dealing with obscure error messages and command line tools and, you know, kind of all, all the, all the joys of programming that are not as joyful, uh, in some senses. Um, but the biggest thing while you're doing that is the, you know, when you encounter something, ask yourself, like, why did this go wrong? Uh, what piece of information could I have used to solve this problem or avoid it? And instead of, um, you know, a lot of people, when you're at a job and you have a deadline, you do what it takes to meet that deadline. Um, and that's sort of the reality. But while you're teaching yourself is making sure you're saying, um, you know, before I continue on, do I really understand what just happened? Um, and that's, that's the primary way that I would start preparing just because I think if you pick a task that is fun and interesting to you, um, you'll, you'll be more likely to get, get further than that. The second way that I would start preparing um, is really to go around to, um, UC Berkeley's course websites and look at content. So most of the lecture videos are public. Most of the assignments are public. Um, the auto grading, uh, you know, and so the solutions are not always public. Um, but the really cool thing about computer science, at least, is if you say, you know, like uh, you're working on a function that, let's say, it like sorts of lists, right? Um, and if you're trying to work on this custom function to sort a list, you get to run the function, look at the output, and maybe the auto grader is not going to tell you uh, if you don't have it, whether or not the output makes sense, but you can probably read the output yourself and decide whether or not it makes sense. Um, are you working on a function to output some graphical content to the screen, right? 
well, does it look like the way you want it to look like? Well, um, you know, if your goal is to just practice, um, that is often plenty good feedback is to just look at the results um, and you can judge whether they're correct. And so, um, you know, I'd start personal and then look at course websites and assignments. Um, if you just Google UC Berkeley CS 61A, UC Berkeley CS 61B, uh, you know, those course websites come up. Um, it doesn't have to be Berkeley. Um, most other uh, large computer science schools, so Stanford, University of Washington, uh, MIT, uh, University of Michigan, Carnegie Mellon, right, uh, Harvard CS50, all of these uh, universities have public versions of at least one or two of their CS courses um, that are intro courses. And so any of those are fantastic sources uh, to start learning from as well. I would say that most of them are designed to be taken, you know, in a university environment with, you know, uh, your peers and teaching assistants. And so um, if you're just starting out on your own, uh, you know, maybe that's having a group of friends around, um, you know, to work on things together um, or, you know, some kind of a study group or uh, doing it after you've taken on uh, some, you know, standard programming tutorials. Um, but they are, you know, they're available, they're free, they're fantastic resources. Uh, plenty of other opportunities on places like edX as well. Um, you know, those courses are, you know, very much uh, in a very similar style to, to what gets taught on campus. Um, it's just a different experience if you're not doing it, uh, you know, in a class during a semester with everyone around you. Yeah, for sure. I feel like getting early on hands-on experience is very beneficial for students to actually get involved in the industry. With that, I'd like to ask um, one final question. Um, what are there any final thoughts you have with, about uh, what all we've discussed yeah, I today? Mean, I, um, I think there's two thoughts just based on the questions is that, um, you know, related to like coronavirus as a whole, um, you know, it definitely sucks that there's a lot of things that people haven't had a chance to do in the past year. Um, you know, miss graduations, uh, school dances, um, you know, club meetings, whatever it is. Um, you know, I would say to like, it's, you know, totally okay to acknowledge, uh, that it sucks to have missed those things. Um, it is also totally cool to be like, Hey, I didn't have to deal with the pressure of school dances this year. You know, I know from a lot of students, like, uh, depending on how you feel about that one, right? Like you're either happy or sad and both feelings are totally valid, but then to recognize that like at the end of this, especially if you're going from, you know, a remote senior year to back in person college that like, um, we've all learned different ways of working together and new tools and experiences. Um, and to take uh, the good and the bad of what's changed in the past year and, and, you know, really think about that for yourself. Um, you know, no one's, it is no one's individual job to collectively solve or, you know, to individually solve like society's pro problems of what we should take forward. Um, but, you know, we should, you know, for each of us think like, what did I do well that really worked for me? Um, especially as you figured out how to learn, right? Like were, was, uh, you know, were the videos that I was watching uh, the way that I like to learn? Or do I really need to be uh, in class in front of a teacher and make sure that in the fall and spring going forward, uh, you know, as a student, you think about that and really take it forward with you. And I think that'll be uh, um, hugely helpful for everyone because we sort of had this natural experiment on ourselves. Um, and if there's something that you feel like you've been missing the past year, like the second that it's safe to get that back, whether that's in-person meetings, um, you know, face to what, you know, whatever it is, um, like go for it. Um, and the second thing like related to just thinking about things is computer science. Um, it's so much more than any one thing or, or set of things that you could learn like at a university. Um, and, you know, at a place like Berkeley, uh, you're really spending a lot of time learning skills that and tools and techniques where they're very, uh, in some sense, abstract. They're things that uh, you will, uh, without even realizing it, use to apply later on. And so what I would say is focus on the fact that if there's a problem that you want to solve, um, you know, that it's personal to you, start with that problem and then figure out how do I apply the things that I've learned or ask yourself, what do I need to learn to solve this problem? 
um, you know, who else do I need to talk to that has more information that can guide me in the right direction? Or, uh, you know, talking with people in communities or your own community, if it's something you know, related to that of like, what is the thing that I can solve? Um, and how can I apply this in, you know, in a really cool way? And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, like, okay, I know how to code, uh, code will solve this problem itself. Um, but really spending time um, sort of thinking critically about uh, the different opportunities that you have. Um, and that is, I think, the really cool thing about computer science as a field is that uh, once you know how to write code, um, it's a really powerful skill that you can learn to use and deploy in, in the right spots. Yeah, for sure. Uh, today, I really enjoyed discussing with you the true applications of computer science and just everything in general with regards to the pandemic and really with how students can get involved in computer science in college after high school. So thank you for interviewing with us today, Mr. Ball. Thanks for listening. Make sure to like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram at inspirante underscore education, and follow our LinkedIn page for updates on future episodes. If you're listening on Spotify, follow our Spotify as well. And if you're on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to get notified about new episodes. Stay tuned for our next episode.